Friends, I'm thrilled to be with you as we start a brand new sermon series. And as we gather together, wherever we are, whether it's your first time or you've been with us for many decades, you might quickly notice I'm dressed a little differently than I normally am. And of course, if it's your first time, you're thinking, why is this guy dressed so casual? Well, it's for a purpose, a very specific reason that connects with our sermon series that we are going to get into today. But I want to let you know that this is one of my most uh, treasured articles of clothing because this was given to me by my grandfather. In fact, this, this Pendleton flannel is older than I am. I think it's at least 50 years old. And my grandfather, whom I love and respect so much, uh, went to be with the Lord over a decade ago. A uh, remarkable man, a very simple man of faith. And this shirt, whenever I wear it, reminds me of him and the wisdom that he passed on to me. But more than that, uh, you know, this shirt has created new memories, kind of inspired by my, my grandpa. In fact, this is the shirt that I love to wear whenever I gather around a bonfire. Now, I know bonfires aren't the everyday experience for me or for anyone. They're, they're special occasions. And yet I've realized that in my life that some very, very meaningful conversations and memories have all been around a bonfire. You know, there's something about it. it, it it's different than just gathering, you know, um, on a video chat, of course. It's, it's very different than gathering around... Uh, you know, a living room. It's very different than gathering in a classroom or a lecture hall or even, you know, in a, in a beautiful sanctuary. There's something about uh, the, the earthliness, the tangibleness, the smell, the sounds, the sights of a bonfire. Over the many years, and again, wearing this very frequently at those bonfires, I've had bonfires in the backyards of some of my closest friends. Uh, I've had bonfires, out camping with my kids and my family. Uh, I've been around bonfires uh, in, in mountains, in deserts, uh, at the beach. I've been on bonfires on mission trips in Africa, in Brazil, uh, on trips to Alaska. These, these moments that I look back on my life upon are so rich. And these experiences that I've had around bonfires are altogether different than other settings because something happens around a bonfire that the best way I could describe is that time begins to melt away. As you take in the light and the warmth of that fire, as you hear the crackling of the, the wood, as you smell the smoke, as you, as you just feel that moment, there's something that that draws you in, that opens you up. Some of the most vulnerable conversations I've ever been a part of have been around bonfires. I've experienced uh, with friends and family tears, <laughs> laughter, promises, asking for forgiveness, extending forgiveness. I I've seen powerful reconciliation happen around bonfires. I've seen people uh, discover who they are, remember who they are. I've seen truth spoken in love. There's moments of extended silence that happen. The, the fullness of humanity and the human experience I've experienced around a bonfire. And so the intentionality of wearing this Pendleton flannel, uh, older than me, uh, connected to bonfires. My hope is that it will remind you as we are in this sermon series of what we are getting ourselves into in this sermon series. In fact, this sermon series is me experienced differently than perhaps you normally would experience a sermon where I or another preacher would get up and, and, and preach uh, and proclaim the truth from Scripture in a particular way. I want to be very clear, uh, the truth of Scripture will continue to be preached and proclaimed, but in a different way than we are used to. Because what we're going to do in this sermon series is we're going to, we're going to sit down with some sages of Scripture, you know, people like Esther and and David, and Martha, and, and Paul, and Peter, Moses. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to sit down kind of standing above Scripture and trying to just pull out principles for our life. Nor are we going to sit uh, at the feet with these sages high up in an ivory tower, you know, kind of raining down truth upon us. 
what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to have a bonfire with the sages in a very relational, intimate, vulnerable, courageous way. And every single week, we're going to focus on one sage of scripture, one hero of the faith. But we're going to imagine through the power of the Holy Spirit being literally around a bonfire. And as we get into this, it's going to require, on one hand, imagination, but not imagination that uh, departs from the truth of Scripture. It actually is an imagination of connecting deeper with Scripture. And as we sit around a bonfire, you're going to have front row seats. You're not kind of on a second or third or a outside looking in vantage point. You are right there in the mix with me and these sages of scripture having a conversation. And as I ask every single week, three questions to each of these sages, we're going to find that their answers are things that we have to just imagine and make up and wonder and write fiction about, but actually their answers are found in scripture. And my hope and my prayer is that as we go through this sermon series, as we sit down at a bonfire with the sages, that this wouldn't just be kind of a neat thing that we do that only exists in this moment or in just this sermon series, but actually you would see an opportunity that whenever you open up scripture, that it's an opportunity not for you to just pull things out, but an opportunity for you to sit down and enter into Ultimately, a relationship with God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, as you, as you interact with these remarkable, wondrous, human, relatable stories and the people that live them. But I think what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to pray before I dive into this, before we enter into this bonfire setting with the particular sage that we have for us today because we need to be led by the Spirit of God, led to truth, led to what God has for us so that we would be transformed to be more and more conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's dive into this, but let's pray first. Loving God, I thank you that you invite us to participate with you in the work that you're doing in this world. And the only way we can do that is if we find our identity, if we find the story of our lives in the story of Scripture. So may this be an invitation in to be with some of the heroes of the faith, an invitation to be with the sages of Scripture. So Spirit of God, would you lead us to your truth? May it transform us for your glory as we long to be your church, the church at work. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we say together, Amen. All right, so imagine with me. Here we are. We are, we're cozying up to a fire. If you could imagine just in that place, pulling up in your favorite chair, bundled up. You've got your favorite drink in hand. You're, you're surrounded by these people. You don't know all their names, but you have this experience all of a sudden in your mind's eye of you are there. You're at this bonfire. I'm there with you. And as we, as we sit there together, as the sound all around of, of laughter and conversation, as we see the, the flickering of light dancing across the faces of those around, as the, as the shadow just dances on the ground, there's this sense of, of being there, not removed, but actually being present. And there's something I've experienced, and I hope that you're experiencing, that when you're at a bonfire, there's something that just draws you in. And in the midst of that being drawn in, I speak up. And I ask the first of three questions. And I say, Abraham. And all is quiet. I have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to have a conversation with Abraham. The father of our faith. And I say, Abraham. I got some questions for you. First question. What did God ask you to take up? And maybe you're thinking in that moment, that's your question? I've got a lot of other questions I want to ask him. Why this? Why that? And yet you wonder, what's he going to say? 
And in this moment, Abraham responds. And he says, one thing. The one thing that God asked me to take up is faith. Faith and faith alone. That was the one thing that I didn't have that God asked me to take up, to pick up, to do the very thing that God commanded me to do. He didn't ask me to pick up good deeds. He didn't ask me to pick up perfection. Uh, he didn't ask me to pick up knowing all the details. He asked me simply to pick up faith. And we know that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of things unseen. And I want you to consider this, that he asked me to pick up faith. And it was faith that enabled me to do the things that God longed for me to do. The only reason why you know my name is through faith. And me stepping out in faith. The only reason why I'm even found in scripture is because of faith. In fact, the only reason anyone would ever write about me is this thing that God asked me to pick up. And I picked it up. And it was faith. And I want you to think about this. Faith isn't something that uh, you can clearly see. Faith doesn't always line up with our circumstances. But again, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of things unseen. And I want you to know, Drew, Bel Air Church, as I answer this question of what did God ask me to take up and I'm giving you the answer that it's faith, I want you to know this, that by faith I obeyed. When I was called to set out for a place that I was to receive as an inheritance and I set out not knowing where I was going. I want you to imagine this. How on earth could I go to a new location leaving my present location not knowing where I was going unless I went by faith? I mean, on one hand, it's, it's so common for you to know uh, and to want to know what the destination is before you leave the comforts of home. You know, it's, it's very normal to want to have identified the apartment that you'll move into, the townhome that you'll move into, the, the home that you will move into before you sell or and the lease of, or to move out of, to, to pack up your home. You want to know the destination before you leave. I couldn't do that. Because God called me to a land in which I didn't know. And the only way I could step out in obedience is if I was able to take up the thing that God asked me to take up. And that was faith. Faith. And I need you to know that it wasn't that I was just a faithful one. No, no, my faith was in God's faithfulness. My faith was in God's promises. And so I went. By faith, I stayed for a long time in the land that I had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with me according to the same promise. For I looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect, and builder is God. By faith, I received power of procreation, even though I was too old. I was, I was a hundred years at the time when Sarah herself was barren. I received the power to have a child, to have Isaac, because I was faithful. And I had faith. And I had faith in the one who had promised it. By faith, I, Abraham, I, when I was put to the test, I offered up Isaac. I, who had received the promises, was ready to, to offer up my only son, of whom I had been told it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. I consider the fact that God is able to even raise someone from the dead, and figuratively speaking, I did receive him back. So I need you to know, in answer to your question, Drew, what did God ask me to take up? It was faith and faith alone. It is the only way. You know who I am? It is the only way in which I was able to experience the, the intimacy and the, the richness and the dynamicness of, of a life that is lived by faith. I can tell you, it wasn't easy. 
Again, circumstances, time went on. There was many moments in which I, I wondered, how on earth is God going to do this? And yet I continued to, to come back to this one, this faithful one who had promised me. And so I stepped out in faith. And as I drew, as I'm hearing Abraham give this, this answer, I, I, I begin to do what I often do around a, a bonfire. I begin to self-reflect. I begin to enter into that answer. I begin to see my life through the lens of that story. And I begin to look on my own life. And I begin to, to think about times in which I stepped out in faith. I think about on April 8th, 2000, where I, I stepped out in faith and I just said, God, wherever you want to take me, I'll follow. Jesus, I, I give my life to you. Very different than Abraham leaving the land of Ur to go to Canaan. There was still an invitation for me to take up faith. And in that moment, I can look back and say, yeah, that, I can relate to that. That's the moment where my faith journey began. When I said yes to Jesus. I didn't know the destination. I didn't know where he was going to lead me, but I said, yes, I want to trust you. I want to follow you. And maybe you, right now with all of us, with me in our mind's eye through faith with Abraham, maybe you in this moment look back on your own life. And maybe there's moments where you, you realize, yeah, that was a moment that I stepped out in faith. That was a moment where I didn't make sense. I didn't see how it was going to play out, but that was a moment that I stepped out in faith. Maybe some of you are in a moment right now where you feel like God is calling you to step out in faith. And you're wondering, can I, should I, uh, is it worth it? Would you hear the response of Abraham who has lived this life that we can find in scriptures? The great father of faith as we get to uh, profoundly impacts our very life today. Would you, my prayer for you, would you around this bonfire in our minds say yes to the same God that called Abraham? Who called Abraham to, to take up faith that you would respond and see that that same invitation for you is to take up faith faith as well. Not in your good deeds, not in your perfect record, but in faith in the one and God's promises. And as we're around this bonfire, I, 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 I'm dying to ask. I'm just bursting at the seams to, to ask this second question. Okay, okay, Abraham. If God uh, asked you to take up faith, what did it cost you to lay down? And in that question, I know from personal experience that to take up something, you have to let go of something else. You know, I drew, I, I, I've experienced this in my own life as I've followed Jesus, as I've taken up a life of following Jesus, I've had to let go of other things. And so genuinely, I'm coming to Abraham and I'm saying, okay, if God called you to take up faith, what was the cost that you had to lay down? And I hear Abraham respond. And he says this, I had to lay down knowing exactly how God was going to fulfill his promises. You know, I wanted to know how. I wanted to know the details. Uh, I wanted to know where we were going. I wanted to know the timeline. I wanted to know all those things. And it was so, it was so tempting for me. And as he's saying this, I'm so relating to this. As he goes on, he says, it was so tempting for me to just want to hold on to being in control to determine all the steps that would get me from point A to point B. And it seemed like God's command didn't always line up with my circumstances. So here God commands me, I want you to leave the land in which you are comfortable in, and I want you to go to a land that I'm preparing for you. And by, as I said, I, I go by faith. And as I go, there's a famine. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, what on earth? God, why would you call me away from comfort into this new land, to Canaan, to this promised place, and now there's a famine and we have to take a detour to Egypt 
And in that moment, I'm thinking, how do I fix this? How do I rectify this? How do I get us back on the right track? And in that moment, we're hearing Abraham respond. In that moment, I took my eyes off of God's promises and I began to focus on my circumstances. And as I drew hear Abraham say that, I'm thinking, oh, I can relate. It is so easy for me and perhaps for you to, to get our focus off of God's promises, to be so consumed by our circumstances, our relational status, the amount of money we have in the bank, what our uh, boss has just said about us, what, what, what society uh, thinks is true, uh, where our ranking is within our company, uh, whatever it might be, a, a comment that someone sends. And we can be so consumed by the circumstances of our life and that can contradict the, the command that God has for us. And I can relate. Can you relate? And as Abraham continues on, he says this. In those moments where I kept my eyes off of the promise of God and I focused on my circumstances, I, I was unwilling to, to lay down, to lay down how God was going to do it. And I took things into my own hand. I can think of two examples. Uh, when we were in Egypt and there was Pharaoh, I was so terrified that he was going to kill us that I, I, I lied and I said that Sarah was my sister and there was some things that happened there that I, I deeply regret. That was an example of me not being perfect, of me focusing on my circumstances, of me not letting go of trusting God and how God was going to do things. And I didn't lay it down then and there was ripple effects and ramifications for that. The second is this, God promised that through me that there would be a mighty nation, that I would have a family with so many descendants that they would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the dust on the earth. And he promised me that when I was 75 years old and years and years and years and years and years go by and still no child. And God's command is for me to go, to be fruitful to be a blessing for all the nations through my large family and I've got no kids. And so the thing that God called me to lay down was knowing exactly how he was gonna fulfill his promise. But in that moment, I, I took matters into my own hands. I didn't trust God. I, I got my eyes off of his promise. I looked at my circumstances, my age, things weren't happening on my timeline. And I had a child through Hagar. And there was ripple effects and consequences of that, but the result of that wasn't coming from a place of faith. And in that moment, I, I didn't lay down knowing exactly how God was going to do it, and I didn't pick up faith. And in that moment, I, I deterred from what God longed for me to experience. And yet God still uses all of our lives, all of the ways in which we don't do the thing that we long to do, God still uses it for God's glory. But I can look back on those moments and realize, yeah, there's, there's moments where I lost track of God's promises. And as I drew him hearing Abraham say this, I, I, I can relate. And I ask you, Wherever you are joining the service right now, as you, as you imagine yourself in this bonfire, as we're together in this moment uh, through our mind's eye and faith, hearing Abraham respond to these questions, are there moments in your life where you've taken your focus off of God's promises and you're just focused on the circumstances? I want you to hear what Abraham has just said. That there's moments where it seems like God's command and your circumstances don't line up. And the temptation is for us in that tension to pick up the solution and focus on how do we solve our circumstances rather than trust God and to walk faithfully through it. And my hope and my prayer is that you would look at Abraham, you would look at his life imperfect completely, and yet a man who ultimately kept coming back to a life of faith. And as we listen to Abraham 
he continues on and he says this. Drew and all of us here, I, I've just shared how there is a, a difficulty, a tension that occurs when God's command and our circumstances don't seem to line up. The choice in those moments has to be to step out in faith. But I want to take it further, Abraham says. What do you do when God's command and God's promises seem to contradict? Not just when God's command and my circumstances contradict, but what happens when it seems like God's command and God's promises seem to contradict? What do you do then? And I'm silent. I'm thinking, I don't know. And Abraham tells the story. Perhaps the most famous story of his life. The story that people around the world and throughout history have told often when they think about Abraham. Because when they think about Abraham, they think about his son, Isaac. And here we are about to hear Abraham continue his answer to my question. What did it cost you to lay down to pick up faith? And he said, what happens when God's command and God's promises seem to contradict one another? And Abraham says this. I've received a promise that through my son Isaac, there would be a family and that family would grow. And through that family, all the nations of the world would be blessed. I've got one son, my beloved son, Isaac, and it's through him that God's promise would be fulfilled. And yet God commands me to take my only son to a place called Moriah and to sacrifice him there. And you might hear that as this odd, horrific, uh, doesn't make sense sort of thing, but here's what I want you to know about how I experienced that. When God asked me to go, it was in the context of following God for many decades. I had responded by faith and God had proved himself to be faithful. Every time when I followed God's command while focusing on God's promises, God was true to God's word. And every time I lost sight of God's promises and didn't follow God's command, but went my own way based on my circumstances, things began to unravel. Worse things happened than I hoped they would. And yet God rescued me. So for decades, I had experienced God as being a faithful God, a loving God, a good God, a God who was true to God's word. And in this moment, when God said to take my only son, through whom the promises of God would be fulfilled, to go and sacrifice him there, in that moment, I went because I knew God was going to work it out. In that moment, I didn't look at the circumstances. I looked at the promises of God, and I trusted, and I stepped out in faith. And if you wonder if that's true or not, I want you to know that I, when I went to that place, which, by the way, was a three days journey. This wasn't three minutes. It wasn't three hours. Three days of living in the tension of how could God's command and God's promise seem to contradict one another. I kept coming back to the faithful one, and I kept moving forward. And once we got there, these are my words recorded in Scripture. I said to my servants, I want you to stay here. My son and I will go up to the mountain. We will go and worship there and we will return. If you have any doubts that I actually thought that I was going to have to literally sacrifice my son, you haven't listened to my words, again, recorded in Scripture. I believed God at God's word, even though it didn't make sense. And that was the ultimate test of my faith. That was the ultimate laying down of understanding a, clearly the picture of how God was going to fulfill God's purposes. And I believed. 
that we would go and that we together, not just I, but we together would come back. And I want you to imagine this. This is Abraham speaking. I want you to imagine this. We began to walk up to Mount Moriah. And I laid wood on my son Isaac's back. And as he walked up, I knew that God would provide. And as we got closer and closer and closer and closer, a conversation ensued with my son. My son asked me, God, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And I answered, not looking at the circumstance, I answered looking at God's promises, and I said, God will provide the lamb. And we made our way all the way to the top. Not seeing how, but God, knowing that God would see to it, that God would somehow untangle this contradiction that perhaps existed between God's command and God's promise. And once we got to the top, after my son had carried the wood on his back, I, I tied him. I laid him on that altar. And in the last moment possible, an angel of the Lord stops me and says, Abraham, Abraham. He shouts my name and I respond, here I am. And this angel speaks with the voice of the Lord and says, I have seen your faithfulness, that you wouldn't withhold your son from me. Look and see, there's a ram, a sacrifice provided so that your son, your only son, won't have to die. And in that moment, I finally realized in the last, can you imagine the last second possible? The answer to how God was going to fulfill God's promises looked very different than I thought, very different than I could have imagined. But had I taken things into my own hand, had I not laid down the need to know exactly how, I wouldn't have experienced that moment in which I, embracing my son, sacrificed before the Lord this ram, and I named that place on Mount Moriah, the Lord will provide. And as I drew him hearing this story, there's, there's details of that story that, that stand out. There's details of that story that catch me perhaps differently than in the past. You know, even in this moment, I, I, I realize it as I've read that story in Scripture in Genesis 22, I've never really caught that. Abraham says to his servant, we're going to go, we're going to worship, and we're going to come back. I also know that when Abraham asks Isaac to carry the wood, it is the only place in the entirety of the Old Testament where a person is asked to carry wood to a sacrifice. I also know that Mount Moriah is the very place of which, as we learned from Abraham himself, that he names the place the Lord will provide. I also know that Solomon one day built the temple there. I know that this exact place where this remarkable thing happened, where things seemed to not fit together until the very last moment where God did provide, becomes the very place where Jerusalem is built, where the temple of the Lord is built, which is many, many years later, the very place that a different son is led up a mount in the same way that Isaac was led up to Mount Moriah, this one in the New Testament was asked, was forced to carry wood on his back to a sacrifice. And I realize as I hear Abraham tell the story as a pastor, as a student of scripture, that there are all these connections. There are all these things that begin to fit together. And when I realized that the same location of Mount Moriah that God provided a different sacrifice, I realized, even as I hear Abraham tell the story, that he had 
longed for a lamb. The conversation with his son was about a lamb, but God provided a ram. A ram and a lamb are two different animals. God didn't miss the memo. There's a point to this fact. Again, many, many, many years later, it is John the Baptist who looks at one person and says, Behold, behold, that's the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That one was Jesus, who is God's only begotten and beloved Son, whom lived the perfect life and was led up a mountain, same geographical location, was led up a hill that was formerly named the Lord will provide, carrying the cross on his back and ultimately going to his death out of love for you and for me. And as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, if God didn't withhold his only son from us, how much more will he not Unveil to us, unleash to us, provide for us because of that. As often happens when I'm in a bonfire, as I'm having a conversation, my mind begins to go to other things. And my hope and my prayer is that you would begin to see, as Abraham is answering these questions, the connection between Isaac and Jesus. That God didn't ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac because ultimately there would be another father, God the Father himself, who would sacrifice his only begotten son so that we would be reconciled to God. He is the sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God. And if Abraham hadn't stepped out in faith, had he not laid down needing to know exactly how was God going to fulfill his promises, that entire narrative that entire story, that entire experience wouldn't have perfectly foreshadowed Jesus. And in this moment in the bonfire, I want to ask Abraham one more question. Was it worth it? Was it worth taking up faith and laying down how God was going to fulfill his promises? Was it worth it? And in that moment, I hear somebody else answer. And he says, was it worth it? I started my gospel account mentioning this moment. And as he begins to say how he starts his gospel, I realize this is Matthew. When he says, this is a gospel of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of David the son of Abraham. And Matthew says to me, now I, I, I'm hearing another voice in this bonfire, as often happens in a bonfire. And Matthew says, do you realize that through those little steps of obedience, those little steps of faith that led to bigger steps of obedience, that led to bigger steps of faith, we not only have Isaac, who has a name, who has a son named Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, who becomes the father of 12 sons, who are the 12 tribes of Israel, who ultimately have a lineage all the way down to King David, who ultimately has a lineage all the way down to Jesus, the very Son of God. And here we are, Matthew is saying, looking back on the unfolding of a story that Abraham couldn't fully see that when God said to him all the way back in Ur, I want you to leave this land. I'm going to make a great nation out of you and all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. We have the vantage point now from scripture to see that who he was talking about was one. One in Abraham's lineage. And that one is Jesus. That through Jesus, the very son of God, whom God gave, not to condemn the world, but to save the world, who gave his life as a sacrifice to reconcile us back to God. Through that one, we can see the whole life of Isaac pointing to, the whole life of Abraham pointing to. Was it worth it? It reveals to us not only how to live as people of faith, but it actually shows us a perspective 
a perspective that is locked on to the one who is perfect, who is holy, who is loving, who invites us into a relationship. So would we be people of faith? Would we be people who lay down the things that we need to lay down so that we can hold on to faith and trust in God through Jesus Christ? Would we be people who would say as we follow Jesus, it is worth it? I want you to imagine, even as we wrap up this sermon, how that conversation would continue to go. How Abraham would continue to answer that question, was it worth it? Maybe it's an exercise that you can do, that you can actually read Hebrews chapter 11. Maybe you can get into the life of Abraham and in the book of Genesis. You can, you can begin to see the fruit of the life that comes when he simply stepped out in faith. Maybe you could ask him yourself, Abraham, was it worth it? And that you would see the answers found in Scripture. But even more than that, would you hear the same questions to you? What is God calling you to take up in this moment? What is the cost that you will have to lay down to take up that thing? And finally, is it worth it? This is the journey that you were called into. This is a journey of faith that you can't live vicariously through someone else. The same God who called Abraham out is calling you out to follow him. And as a church family, we long to be a people that follow Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. And in doing so, we become a church. We become a people, a people of God defined by the reality of who Jesus is. And this invitation to be the church is not only to be the church, but to be a church at work. And some of the work that we are called to is to invite one another into a deeper knowledge of Jesus. And as we enter into the rest of this worship service, may we not leave this bonfire experience behind in the sermon, but would we take that in the weeks and months and years ahead to how we see a visual opportunity to enter into the story of Scripture. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you invite us to come, that you've invited us to put our faith and trust in you in the same way that Abraham was called to put his faith and his trust into a loving God. Would you give us the gift of faith? Would you give us through the power of your spirit the ability to hold on to your promises, to step out and follow you despite our circumstances? And may we find in you a deep and everlasting joy, a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we say together, amen.